have memories of being in my mother's womb. I have memories of clawing my way out of it. The various shrinks I've seen over the years claim this is impossible. There are examples of prenatal memories, but these are short-lived and fetuses only. I've been told my memories are false ones, that my father just told me the story of my birth and my mind filled in the blanks. I know this isn't true. I remember the dark, the warmth, the gentle sloshing of amniotic fluid. I also remember the pain. There was a sharp flare in my abdomen where the umbilicus met my navel, like a kidney stone moving in reverse. A sudden claustrophobic dread overtook me, the need to stretch, the need to move, consume me. There was more pain, splitting of skin, like teeth sprouting from an infant's gums as pointed bone breached the tips of my fingers. I clawed, slashed, spasmed. Little points of light appeared in the dark, stars in my mother's uterine lining. I thrust my hand out, my mother pushed back, as if to force me back in, but by then, I couldn't be denied. I had to get out. Then my dark little world filled with light, and my father pulled me into his arms. We were out in the shed, where my father did his woodworking. I was ten. My father looked so old in my memories, but at the same time, he was only twenty-eight. Already, his face was gaunt, his hair prematurely gray and thinning, and the whiskey weeping from his pores choked out the pleasant vanilla aroma from the oak firewood on the cutting table. It doesn't have to be perfect, he said. I know, I said. The sweat stuck to my face, my armpits stung my eyes, and soaked the fingers of the leather gloves my father made me wear. The sharp bones jutting from my fingertips reminded my father of what was to come hence the gloves. He instructed me as I took knives, gouges, and chisels to the wood. I flaked oak away, piece by piece. My father grunted in pain. I tried not to notice as he struggled to pour a slug of Jack Daniels into his paper cup. He downed the whiskey and massaged his left wrist. I saw it, a black clot forming his radial artery, pulsed and swelled like it might burst until the thrombus worked its way through the blood vessel and continued its journey to my father's heart. He lit a cigarette. I was just about finished with the token. Should I use the belt sender now? I asked. He was still in pain. He rolled his hand at the wrist. The cigarette smoke clashed with the whiskey stink wafting off him. No time. He said, then patted me on the shoulder. Good job, pal. The only gigs are mostly found in Europe generally carved into buildings, like a cathedral or a castle. They depict a naked woman with her legs spread to expose an exaggerated vulva. These were meant to ward off evil, demons and such. The Sheila and the gigs my father and I created in our shed, however, always looked vaguely demonic to me. Their spread legs and cavernous birth canals reminded me of dark, wet, unyielding places. Places where one couldn't move or stretch. We placed the token into a large ceramic bowl. I sprayed lighter fluid into the bowl and struck a match. My father's bedroom was oppressively hot. Our house had no central air conditioning, and due to the frequency of my father's episodes, putting a window unit in his rooms was impractical. There was a thin mattress on the floor. There were a dozen battery-powered AM-FM radios situated around it. My father sat cross-legged on the mattress his blood vessels pulsing black against his translucent skin. I took the ashes from the ceramic bowl and smeared them across the windowsill. The window was already boarded shut, framing nails and planks, but we could never be too careful. You want me to turn the radios on? I asked. No, Bell, I got it. He said. I love you, Dad. I said. He smiled through his pain. It was happening faster than usual. His eyes had already gone black, like they'd been dipped in ink. Love you too, pal. He answered. I left him and shut the door. I clicked the padlocks into place, four of them, and smeared the last of the ashes across the threshold of his doorway. Inside, my father turned the radios on one by one, maximum volume, and static blared through the hallway. I lay in bed, in the dark, even with the radio static and the rattling wheeze of my air conditioner, I could hear my father's transformation. He choked, he spat, something wet splattered onto his floor. 
I never could sleep through his episodes. I just lay there, frozen in terror, listening. Oh, I never feared that he'd get out. Between the padlocks, the boarded up window, and the ashes from the token, escape was impossible. The radio static, though obnoxious to my ears, kept him sedated. The source of my terror, the thing that kept me awake all night during his episodes, was the knowledge that, someday, I'd suffer the same fate. Then from down the hallway came a mournful, gurgling howl. I shot up, nearly panicking before I summoned enough courage to check on him. Though the radio static masked my footfalls, I stepped quietly towards his door, then peered through the keyhole. He stood with his back to the door. He was naked. There was black vomit at his feet. His face had opened like a flower in bloom. Five distinct petals of flesh peeled back from his skull. When it happens to me, I thought, I hope it doesn't hurt. I sat in the darkness of my bedroom until dawn broke. When warm daylight began to trickle in through the curtains, I walked with a stagger, my thoughts formless and muddy, intoxicated from exhaustion. Out in the hallway, I noticed that my father's radios had gone silent. I tiptoed past his door, downstairs, and stole into the kitchen for my reward, a little gift to myself for getting through yet another night with my father. The first time I stole a sip from his whiskey, I nearly vomited. Now I'd come to like it. Though the heat from yet another swampy summer morning had already filled the house with a cloying humidity, I drank deeply, guzzling the Jack Daniels in three long gulps. I let the elixir warm my frayed nerves. I slipped the bottle back to its place on the counter and returned to the hallway to check on my father. His face was whole again, the corruption gone from his blood vessels. He had trouble standing. He was so dehydrated from the heat his muscles kept cramping painfully. I got him a glass of water. He nursed it. Then he asked for whiskey and nursed that too. How long before the next one? I asked, meaning his episodes. My father shrugged. A month if we're lucky. They used to occur every three months. Did you sleep? Yes, and no. I answered. Go lay down then, pal. He said. You did a good job. Thanks, Dad. Love you. I said. Love you too, pal. He said. I slept in the basement with my mother. It was cool down there and I liked seeing her after one of my dad's episodes. She'd been there for years, for a long time. She smelled quite bad, but the stink faded with her flesh until she was just dry bones with no particular smell at all. Lying down next to her, taking great care not to touch her, as her bones were so brittle they'd likely turn to dust, I rested my head on my pillow and thought, When I crawled out of you, you tried to push me back in. I think that means you loved me very much. It sounded like a child breathing with wet gravel in its lungs. Damp wheeze, high-pitched whimper, gurgled exhaustion. I blinked twice, roused from my slumber. The last gas of evening sunlight shone through the basement windows like melted butter. My father crouched over me, naked. Clawed hands on his knees, the flower petals scraps of his face blooming to reveal the grotesque pistol, emerging wet and dark from his skull. The corrupted ichor that had polluted my father's veins now dripped from the protuberance that sprouted from his skull. The pistol. Something between a flaccid penis and a proboscis. Worm from left to right, sniffling inches from my face with nostrils like puckered anuses. My stomach lurched. I had vomited at the sight. With the terror of witnessing firsthand what my father had become twisted my guts in a knot. He'd suffered another episode mere hours after the last. I never had much reason to fear his transformations, outside of the grim fact that I'd suffer them myself one day. The locks, the nailed planks, the calming radio static, and the blessed ashes from the burned Sheila and the gigs had always been enough to keep my dad in his bedroom. It had all become routine. Now he was out. I shut my eyes tight, not wanting to look at the thing my father became. I felt tears coming, but these tears were wrong. They ached, they stung. Whatever it was working its way through my tear ducts had no basis in biology. 
No water, no sodium, no glucose or lipids. As the tears came, they felt like motor oil running down my cheeks. The thing that my father became grunted. The sound shocked my eyes into opening. The thing reached forward with one clawed hand and gently wiped my cheek with the pad of its thumb. Its pale digit came away slick with black ink, with that corrupted ichor. Then there was a sound, something wet and pulpy and growing. The thing swung its mangled face toward my mother's bones and growled. Meaty raw flesh now blanketed her pelvic bones. The meat twitched and pulsated. A slit appeared in the flesh. Two vertical lips bubbled up from the pulp and promptly flushed with blood, inflating the lips into a garish, exaggerated approximation of a vaginal opening. Mom? The thing that was my father roared and pounced. The black ink weeping from its pistol dribbled across my shirt as the thing snarled and thrust its claws into my mother's bones. I fled. The thing that was my father let out a melancholic wail, a cross between a weeping child and a dying man's scream, but returned to its grisly business with my mother's bones before giving chase. Panic rose in my throat as I fled up the stairs, slammed and locked the basement door behind me, then rushed toward the upstairs hallway. Halfway up the staircase, the thing rammed through the basement door, shattering the lock and turning the door to splinters. Rounding the staircase, legs pumping, I decided to make for my father's room. The ashes from the last Sheila and a gig were gone. The padlocks for his bedroom door were worthless as the latches were located on the outside face of the door. All I had left were the radios. I didn't bother shutting the door behind me as he'd only smashed through it. I snatched the closest radio, turned it on, and jacked up the volume until static filled my ears. Behind me, I could hear the thing's footsteps booming down the hallway. I turned on another radio, cranked up the volume, then did the same thing with a third. The thing wailed and came rushing into the bedroom and I took that third radio static blaring and thrust it toward the creature. The thing wailed and came rushing into the bedroom and I took that third radio, static blaring, and thrust it toward the creature. The creature stopped. I stood there facing the thing that was my father, black sweat pouring down my face black tears streaking down my cheeks. As I held the radio, there was a dim flare of pain, sharp but distant, and I saw that my claws had pushed farther outward from my fingertips, pointed bone-like daggers that had poked holes through my leather gloves. The creature saw this too. Its pistol went limp, its shoulders went slack. The creature turned away from me and crawled onto my father's mattress. Slowly, I placed the radio on the floor at the foot of the mattress and crept toward the door. The creature let out a sound, not unlike a whimper. I didn't know what else to do, so I went out to the shed, grabbed some wood, and got to work. I worked well into the night without my father supervising me. It took me a long time to carve these shilina gigs. They were ugly, with rough angles, but as my father had said, they didn't have to be perfect. I was just starting my fourth token when my father appeared. Even made whole again, he didn't look the same. His skin had gone paler, his thinning gray hair had turned white, his eyes were bloodshot, red, not black, thankfully, and he held a whiskey bottle in one hand and a steak knife in the other. We should be ready for next time, I said, yet the rising ball in my throat betrayed my veil of confidence. My father said nothing. He tilted the bottle back and drank deeply, amber beads rolling down his chin until the bottle was empty. I tried to return to my work, but my father took my hair into his fist. I felt the rusted edge of the steak knife against my throat. Behind me, my father sobbed. I love you so goddamn much, pal, he said. I love you too, dad, he said. I began to cry as I waited for the knife to kiss my neck. But after a moment, my father set the knife aside. He took a deep breath. You go to bed now, he said. I've got work to do out here. I wanted to sleep next to my mother again. But when I went to the basement, I saw that her bones had been completely pulverized, turned to dust. The pulpy flesh that had appeared between her legs was gone. Nothing left but a wet, 
red smear-like stain on the floor of a butcher shop. My father worked through the night, then got me the next morning. He stunk of body odor and sweat, of whiskey and cigarettes, and pulled me out of bed by my ankle. I screamed, Dad, stop, Dad! But he paid me no mind as he dragged me through the hallway. He held my ankle tight, squeezing till the veins in his hand puffed out, and I saw black clots streaming through his blood vessels. He wept quietly, the corrupted ichor streaming down his cheeks. In the yard I saw a shovel, the spade thrust in the soil like a knife sticking out of a dead man's back. He took me to the shed, the shielding gigs I made the night before were gone. The ceramic bowl that held their ashes sat on the floor, the bowl smeared in soot. Upon the woodworking table my father had constructed a rectangular box from scraps of plywood. Though I didn't want to believe it, it only took me a few seconds to recognize the box for what it was. A crude coffin. I hyperventilated, caught in the grip of a fear so intense that when I tried to appeal to my father, I could only get out a staccato. He dumped me into the lidless coffin. While the coffin's exterior was crude and simple, my father had spent considerable effort carving detailed vaginal shapes across the coffin's interior walls. I scratched and clawed and slashed at his arm, but my father held me firm as he reached for the lid. My panic receded just enough to allow for grim resignation and a bit of clarity. My father, unable to open my throat with that steak knife, had instead decided to bury me. Dad, I don't like the dark, I said. He paused, his face furrowed, eyes downcast, unable to look me in the eye. He did, however, snatch a small flashlight from the shelf, then tossed it inside with me before he hammered the lid shut. Outside the plywood walls of my coffin, my father worked in the yard. He'd grunt, then came the scrape of steel against soil. He was digging a hole. If I screamed, no one would have heard me. The coffin was too tight to bend my knees, so I couldn't kick the walls. The lid was too low for me to properly push against it. Yet even if someone might have heard me, or if my confines were large enough to try to force my way out, I wouldn't have done any of these things. To do so would have only reinforced the reality that my father was going to bury me alive. Instead, I lay there, still as a corpse, and told myself that my father loved me, that he wouldn't go through with it. However, a thought lingered in the back of my mind like a nail in my shoe. He's going to go through with it because he loves me. Even after my father finished burying me, I remained perfectly still. An attempt to move would only prove that I couldn't. I remained perfectly quiet. Screaming or even breathing too heavily it would cause an echo that would only remind me that I was buried, that I was trapped. So I lay in the dark. The flashlight, that token of mercy my father provided me, sat snug between my right thigh and the wall of the box. I ran my forefinger across the plywood beneath me. It had dust on it. No, not dust. This was ash. The ashes from the shielding gigs I'd made and my father subsequently burned. Just like the ashes I used to seal my father inside his bedroom during his episodes. A realization, then. I pressed my fingertips together. Without me having noticed, my claws had grown even sharper. Doing my best to avoid unnecessarily bumping the plywood, I raised my hand to my face. I felt thin, long seams running across my face, like fissures that had only opened a fraction. The seams were wet, they had a texture like flower petals damp with morning dew. I fumbled for the flashlight and clicked it on and saw that my hand was covered in black ichor. My father had buried me alive because he knew my first episode was imminent. Black tears filled my eyes. I sobbed and then scratched my claws against the lid. With my hands parallel to my chest, my claws left little divots in the wood just inches above where I lay. I scratched again and again and again, then the claustrophobic horror coiling in my chest sprouted violently and I screamed, my voice pinging right back at me as I bucked and shuddered against the unyielding wood. My thigh bumped the switch on the flashlight and the light went out. In the dark, I heard fluid trickling into the coffin, 
The fluid leaked down the walls and began pooling beneath me. I ran my fingers along the walls as much as I was able given the space and felt the viscous liquid weeping from the vaginal openings my father had carved into the coffin. I didn't need to click on the flashlight to know that the fluid was black as ink. The ichor poured into the coffin as a steady clip. It wasn't long before it reached my ears, my jawline. It wasn't long before the ink sloshed over my lips then crept ever higher. Then, as the ichor tickled my nostrils, I opened my mouth to scream, but the ink flooded down my throat. In the dark, red pinpricks filled my vision, a murderous red like bloody stars in a night sky. And then I choked on the ichor in my lungs. A voice soothed me. You're going to be just fine, dear boy. You're going to be what your father could only see in his nightmares. And I found that I wasn't choking at all, that the black ink in my lungs was no different from the amniotic waters of the womb. Though I was still inside my coffin, my disembodied third eye opened, dripping blood and blackness, and I saw quite clearly as my father, shovel in hand, claws sprouted but his face intact despite the ink pulsing visibly through his veins, frantically ripped a hole in the soil above my coffin. I closed my third eye then waited calmly in my wet, black casket. Then came the squeal of loosened nails, the thunder crack snapped from plywood splitting. Loose soil streamed into the coffin as my father tore the lid off. Within it he glimpsed the perfection that was his son. My father glimpsed my fractured, flower petal face and my wriggling pistol as I drove my claws through his throat. Her mother. I said in a hoarse sound that, to the trained ear, could have been interpreted as human speech. And so, I finished this journal, diary, admission of guilt, by saying the preceding events occurred 19 years ago. I am, now, one whole year older than my father had been when I murdered him, and yet I've still only experienced that single episode. An hour after I killed my father, I look like myself again, just another healthy American boy. However, I know that, eventually, I'll experience it again. I'm not afraid, far from it. Having had time to dwell on my transformation all these years, I've come to realize something. I liked it. Every now and then I'll glance at my veins and see what appears to be a dark splotch just under my skin. Blink and you'll miss it, and it's gone. Come to think of it, I've been seeing those splotches more and more lately. Who knows? By the time you get done reading this, maybe, just maybe, this flower will have bloomed again. And scene. That was a bit of a trippy one, but I liked it. Uh, I haven't read anything super literary like that in quite a while, uh, so that was quite a joy. Uh, a lot more esoteric. I'm not sure how well I'm going to do with all the sound effects here but I'll do my best. A lot of them are like sounds that I don't really want to do because I don't like how they sound and they're just more painful to the ears than helpful to the story. So maybe there won't be as much sound effects in this one. If that's the case, I'm sorry. But thank you so much for listening. I really enjoyed the story. Thank you to the author for letting me read it. Uh, let me know what you thought in the comments. And of course, leave the like and the subscribe and all that so that the channel can continue getting big number. So, yeah, oh, and uh, although it's going to be a little bit late whenever you hear this, uh, thank you for 18k on the channel. It's been a couple days now, probably, when you're hearing this. Maybe I made a community post. Maybe I didn't. Uh, but anyways, thank you so much for your support, and I hope you all keep listening and keep enjoying the stories. Much love, ego, volt, anima, vestra.